awesome. So thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, Brandy Coffey. I'm in the Southwest Florida area. I am the luxury regional ambassador for North Florida. And I'm also an operating principal of two market centers. And I do have some other companies that I own, property management. Um, I have a team called the Coffee Group Fine Homes International, which is a, an expansion team. And we do belong to many different communities, one of which is luxury. I also have a repair and remodel company, interior design, and we are launching a marketing uh, company and title and mortgage by the end of the year. So we are basically a, what we call a concierge level experience for all our clients, our agents. We want to make sure that the client is having the ultimate experience from start to finish and no matter which, which price point they're in. Um, we also have a coaching company. So we actually coach a lot of our top agents on how to really follow a career visioning process. And then we will train or hire that admin for their team. So I love wealth building and helping not only my clients, but my agents also wealth build. So one thing that we do is we have a transaction coordination company and, and we make sure that those agents have leverage and we pride ourselves on that. So we're laser focused right now with production. We know that if people are producing on our team or whether they're in our market center, they're actually going to be happier and be serving and giving the ultimate experience to their clients. We have a really high per agent production level in uh, the market center in Venice, which also is Sarasota County. And we have an office in Northport and we have the highest new agent production. We have each new agent is actually doing one to two deals per month. And we have some agents that are brand new within 30 days closing on multi-million dollar properties. So coaching and training and leverage are the things that we're super laser focused on. Um, one thing that we also are implementing right now with a shifting market is we have a tiered uh, custom marketing plan, which offers different levels of commission. So I know people are getting squeezed on that right now. And what we do is we just say, we will tailor it based around your needs, especially in luxury, because they might not be able to make the repairs or actually do what needs to be done interior design wise to get the highest price. So we're finding in luxury right now, to shift, we actually have to do a lot for that seller, or maybe they haven't been able to come back to the property. They're in Canada. They just want to sell it. They haven't used it during COVID. So we've actually remodeled homes before we've put them on the market and there's no money out of their pocket. And we just get paid a little higher commission at the end. So for example, we did, we just sold a $2.3 million property with 8% commission. So obviously it's negotiable, but we're, we're basically covering all objections right now and taking every objection off the table so that whatever their needs are, we're going to tailor around those needs. Um, I'd love to be able to take any questions that people have. I am watching the chat for you. Sure. I don't see anything in the chat. So you want me to just keep going or? I'll, I'll ask you a question actually. So why did you find it um, a value to go ahead and set up all these companies that you set up? So for instance, um, we didn't start them to be these additional profitable companies. There was a need that we saw and basically it wasn't being delivered, right? So we had contractors coming and giving these exorbitant type quotes or estimates to clients that were either in state, out of state. Maybe they didn't know that Florida is a very transient state for contractors. And we have a GC on our team. So we just decided, listen, this is your background. This is your father's a builder. Um, we know that these quotes are really high. And why don't we just form another company and offer to negotiate with those vendors on their behalf? We'll manage the project if they're from afar or if they want to manage it, fine. We're still willing to negotiate on their behalf. Now, if we're present and they're out of state and we manage the project, we just charge them a percentage override, if you will. 
but the money that they are saving on us negotiating with these vendors more than pays for our percentage override on the deal. And it's just a win-win. And they know that we are working to get them the most money in their pocket. We know that these remodeling efforts will actually generate a higher profit for them to net on the home. And again, a lot of the people are not here. So it was also a convenience factor, especially with luxury homes. I had 11,000 square foot home that the gentleman um, was a, a plastic surgeon and he just couldn't get away. He was recruited to California. Now he's in uh, Indianapolis and he gets recruited all over the country. So for him to be able to fly back and manage a remodel on this size home or staging it. We also have a staging company that I own. So I, I really just felt that every single time I was third partying something out, they were not giving the same ultimate experience. And for me, unless you have above a 97% client satisfaction rate, I just, I can't have you on my vendor list. So we were surveying all the vendors and getting feedback, no matter which company background they had. And they were always falling below that 97%. And they were pretty close to that, but they just weren't understanding the expectations and, and how we deliver on our end. So of course, you know, we didn't want to let the client down. So it was really just a need and a void in the industry that I still see to this day. Great. And to copy off of that or jump off of that, I, I felt the same thing running my real estate team. How Ever, I just don't have the time in the day to be able to manage all those different companies. So how do you do that? People. <laughs> I have a really great people. Um, we actually just hired some more talent and we're really going to take this marketing company further. Um, we have a great marketing firm that we leverage already, but when I have to wait to get things from California, um, obviously there's a, a delay in time for certain things. So I actually went out and leased a, a huge printer that would print all of our property brochures, just listed, just sold postcards so that the agents, even in my market center have leverage. Like we can have these the next day for you. And you can even do a test print so you can bring that to your listing consultation. Maybe you want to do a custom eight page brochure. It's great to have the video brochure, but we've used the video brochure more as like a commercial or um, something about our team. And we've sent that more as a pre-list. And of course we can have a video brochure that we give to the cooperating buyer agents, but we always notice that some people like a custom eight page brochure with copyright that's written by a professional writer. And based on the notes I've taken from my either phone or zoom pre-listing conversation, if they're not local. Okay. And when you're going through the process of setting up all these different companies, what are the biggest challenges you kind of came across that you would probably advise other people to maybe do differently? Definitely make sure that you go three deep with your references. Do not skip the career visioning process. I know we get really stuck on these job matches when we do the KPA or career visioning. I do believe that no matter who you're hiring, um, any relationship you're going to be in, I think you really need to know their strengths and weaknesses. And every time you skip a step in that career visioning process, one, you're not bonding with them. And two, you're just not really understanding where they're going to fit in in the partnership. So then there becomes a disconnect and then you get upset or hold resentment with that partner. And the reality is it's your fault, right? You have to take full responsibility and accountability for not really getting to know them at a super high level. I mean, I have KPAs on some of my top agents and teams that I've helped build within the market center where they've divulged information that no one else knows, you know, and we now have this bond where it'd be very difficult for them to leave the brokerage. Like we have created this camaraderie and this bond with very personal information. I know about every life experience, whether it was negative or positive, that it shaped who they are, affects every decision that they make, their interactions with other agents, other clients. And it helps me better coach them because I know where they're coming from and, and why they have that reaction to certain things. Awesome. Anybody else have any questions? What, and, I got one more on top of that. So what is your most um, 
used business that you've got. So I figure that's kind of like your tool belt. So what's your most right. sharpened tool? So I would say property management. We've really grown that exponentially and we really steered clear of seasonal rentals in the beginning. We wanted to ensure that we were giving a great client experience on the annual side and we knew that would be another division within the property management group. So we we started small and now we kind of did it like the little ink blot like you do with expansion and just go to the next county and we realized when we went to the next county, organically, we defaulted in having to do seasonal vacation homes because there was no county ordinance in place with a minimum of 30 days like there is on the mainland in Sarasota, which I found some attorneys don't even know. And it's not legislation because that's so much harder to get past. And obviously, we have to wait a lengthy amount of time for that to happen. So they put this ordinance in place that a lot of people are unfamiliar with. But just south of us in Charlotte County, we discovered, wow, this is a different animal. And my property manager happened, happened to live there and said, I think we can build this out and we can make this very lucrative. So we have beachfront homes on Minnesota Key that we are actually doing short-term rentals on when people are not there. And it's not the typical vacation rental, right? Somebody is coming and staying there for two or three weeks with their family and they're enjoying the privacy. We've had some, you know, celebrities where we've had to, you know, sign non-disclosures <laughs> athletes because it's so remote and it's so quaint and charming and they're not bothered They're Nobody's going to knock on their door or know they're there. So it really has been the best leverage for my team and my brokerage, because I don't know about you all, but have you ever worked with a really, um, non-responsive management company. And then your client gives you that feedback and it, it ultimately, you know, reflects on you and your experience that you're delivering. All right. Does anybody have any questions around that? I don't want to steal all of the questions, but I'm curious by nature, so I don't mind doing it. Yeah, of course. Of course. All right. So we are talking about the shifting market. So what does it look like during this whole craziness, has it been pretty much easy? And what do you expect going into the shifting market or what do you know going into this shifting market? So I'm really excited about this, the shifting market, not only for business opportunities, I'm also an investor. So, you know, my, I have an eye on a couple of commercial buildings. Um, I think this is when our clients need us the most. And it just goes back to the fundamentals where you can go and take market share. There's so much opportunity I act as a, a single agent, so I prefer to be a fiduciary to my clients. I know that varies from brokerage to brokerage, but I leverage that to the highest degree in, in shifting markets where basically I, I know I don't have a duty to the transaction. I basically am going to do what's in your best interest and advise and consult with you versus selling. So I know there's a lot of uncertainty and you know controlling the dialogue is a challenge, but I think there's three main things that we need to focus on is one expired listings. There's huge opportunity right now. We didn't have those for a while. So if, if that's your strength, go after those for sell by owners, especially in the luxury. And then I think there's some commercial opportunities. So if you have a great commercial referral partner, fantastic, or maybe, you know, we've added a commercial division within our team and then also each brokerage so that we are kind of staying in our lane. I do have a commercial background, but for me, I'm still not going to be able to give them all the time based on my schedule. So I think looking for not only buying your own commercial space, but also maybe an opportunity for your clients, keeping an eye on those things. And then I think also buying businesses, you know, Gary talks to us all the time about uh, buying title companies or mortgage companies. I think you're going to see a lot of mortgage companies and title companies not understand this market. I'm already seeing mortgage companies go up for sale. I've met with six different title companies in the last six months um, to either do a JV or buy them out. I just had a title company call me yesterday and basically tell me, we'd like to sell it to you. I didn't even approach them. I didn't even know they were for sale. So I think just making sure that you let everyone know that you're a business owner versus a salesperson is going to be the most important thing. And those CEOs in the luxury market, they're going to respect you more if you operate like that as an organization 
versus just maybe a listing agent or a salesperson. I think they're going to want to do more business with you. And that can lead to, again, a lot of commercial opportunities, even if you're just getting a referral on it. I mean, I had an agent on my team last year that had no commercial experience, but she was advising her client and she used to work for him in a restaurant. He inherited a apartment complex from his dad. He was running it and realized this isn't really fun to manage. So we brought in our management company to consult. Inevitably, he decided he wanted to sell and we had shown the value add in the company and we sold it for $12 million. So she had a almost a $200,000 check just based on letting us handle it. So everybody made a really nice commission and she didn't have to really worry about the liability of doing something that she's not experienced in. I got to remember to unmute. So listening to you right now, um, it's inspiring. And at the same time, it's kind of scary because I we're talking about shift and the shifting market but it's also a shift in mindset to, cause you're, you're talking about becoming a business owner and maybe a lot of the agents on here are just that they're agents. So sales agents, like you were saying, so you're shifting mindset to becoming more of a business owner as well and taking on that opportunity. What was that like when you first took that on? I mean, was it just that just a mind shift and just did it or was there some, <laughs> a learning curve there? Um, I, I am a risk taker. So full disclosure, I mean, I, I launched my first brokerage before I was 30 and it was in 2008. So everyone thought I was crazy. Um, I started as a receptionist in a real estate office and I didn't even have my license. I had a bachelor's degree in psychology and I'm like, well, what am I going to do with this? Um, I really wanted to be a professional student. And my dad was like, uh, no, we're not going to just pay for 20 years of college for you to not go work. But um, somehow I discovered Keller Williams along the way. Um, I ended up managing that firm, got my broker's license two years in. I started taking the class a year and a half in, got recruited by a commercial guy. And then I got recruited after that by a, um, a new construction waterfront builder. So I kind of learned the new construction side on under a million. And then I got recruited to this guy's company who's still a friend of mine and a mentor in the really water world. Really good. I don't know. So um, basically, you know, I, I look at every person, including the DFI in my market center as a person that's a business owner, right? They're looking to grow. So one thing I, I share with every new agent coming into my company is that path to um leadership, if you will, like you can pretty much be anywhere you want to be right in five years. And that happened. That happened to me. I started, I was like, I got licensed in 2004 after being a receptionist, making peanuts <laughs> per hour running and end up running the real estate office. Um, then got my broker's license and got some experience and learned from some really amazing, smart people, way smarter than I ever dreamed of being. And then, you know, four years later, I'm, I'm launching and starting my own brokerage. And then KW obviously took notice and decided to partner with me. So I think it's just really figuring out a game plan, you know, setting high goals and thinking big and not letting anyone discourage you. I remember a title rep and I still know her name first and last name. She's still in the business. And she walked in that office to drop off the candy at that front desk. And I just, we were talking and I said, I'm going to be a top agent one day and I'm going to be number one at the board. And she giggled, you know, and dropped off the company and was like, okay, kid, good luck. You know, like everybody says that. And that just empowered me. I'm like, okay, I guess I'll just show everyone. And so, you know, obviously give back, teach in your market center, encourage anyone, you know, like that, that DFI is probably the most important person in your market center. So if you're in leadership or you're an agent, treat them like gold, ask them what they need, because that person might be running that company one day and maybe they're going to want to hire you, you know, right. Or partner with you on a business. I see our DFI in here. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Michelle, they couldn't do anything without us, could they? <laughs> All right. So any other advice going into a shifting market? <clears throat> Um, I mean, simplify, obviously, your budget. Um, 
I teach KWKC uh, or Quantum Leap for KWKC with young adults. I wish someone would have taught me about money. Um, my favorite class to teach is the path of money. I would definitely teach the six personal perspectives in your market center. It'll help you understand how to master being a business owner better. Um, and then become a KWKC instructor. I'll tell you, I learned more about money because I was forced to get really, really good at it by teaching young adults. And obviously it's a great way to give back. So that will help you. Ben Kenny also does a really, excuse me, good um, leadership workshop. It's kind of like a training series. Series. Um, I would read the book by Thomas Wheelwright. It's called Tax-Free Wealth. And then he just came up with another one. I think it's six strategies um, on how to um, basically structure your tax situation in a better way. I'm not a CPA, but Thomas Wheelwright is Robert Kiyosaki's CPA. So if you just go to his website or you Google it, you'll see his new book on Amazon. I just got it. So I haven't read it, but I've had stellar reviews on it. So, you know, print out your last three bank statements and highlight as much as you can and make sure that anything that's unnecessary is basically cut. The only thing I'm not cutting are my people. I believe my people are the most important. Matter of fact, I just hired two operations people for my team. Um, they're aligned with my belief system. They're from a nonprofit background. I do a lot of charity work. I'm on a lot of boards for different charities. So I think that that is important to you know make sure that your people understand everyone's responsible for lead generation. Now, if you're a single agent, you're just going to have to double down on that lead generation. But if your budget's out of whack, or maybe because we've made so much money the last couple of years, um, you're not looking at it the same way that you would. So just kind of printing out your last three bank statements gives you an idea of where you're at and then looking at what you can cut on the personal and the business side. I know sometimes we just look at the business, but the business funds our personal side. So we should be paying for that lead generation. We should be paying for our people. But are we living a lifestyle that's maybe above where we should be because we kept we expected this to keep going? And again, you might make more money in the shift, but it's always nice to be prepared. And if you look at the average months of any recession through all the recessions we've had, they're right around 18 months. So when people say you need six months of reserves, I'm going to have 18 months just because, just in case. And will, will I need 18 months? Probably not, but I'd rather be prepared for that. So it's as simple as really just making sure that, you know, your budget is as tight as it needs to be. Okay. I do like that part about the um, people. I think that's really important. A lot of people want to, they know that a person is probably their highest expense and they want to cut them first, but they're also their leverage to be able to do more. And they're not just, they're not really an expense. They're an investment. They really are an investment. I mean, I look at, you know, we hired two people and one person wanted a little higher salary than we had budgeted for. And I said, okay, well, I have this marketing company. You're going to be helping marketing with my team. Um, I would also like you to help with this new marketing company. And I'm not saying he's going to run it, but I want to see what he can do. If he's going to take that, that salary that we're paying him and he brings in three times that to any one of my businesses total, I'm happy, but I also have set the expectation of what we need. And you have to be really, really clear with your job description and that career visioning part. Otherwise, there, like I said, there's going to be a huge disconnect. So in the shift for luxury, do you expect to see pricing go down? We're already seeing a lot of price corrections. Um, obviously, people did not expect what's happening. Uh, I know Obviously, Gary's been talking about this for a long time. So I think we are at a, an advantage. I think we've anticipated this more than most people. But yeah, we're already seeing a price correction. Um, we have more inventory in my area. Prices are still going up in certain price points. I mean, obviously, anything under 500000 is still moving very quickly. Um, but that anything like in that five to nine you're seeing corrections and then obviously Uber Lux, anything above 3 million, you're starting to see those too. You're still seeing a lot of movement from one to 2 million. I feel like that's an entry level luxury for our particular area. So you're still seeing a lot of movement there. 
but that Uber Lux, I consider above three or above five, it's you're starting to see days on market. But the reality is, I mean, we were at 18 days for a national average forever. We were at uh, median days, five to six days to contract in my area for over two years. So um, that was a really unrealistic view on the housing market. That's never happened. And so, you know, we're just going to go back to a normal market, in my opinion, and it's going to be a little bit more balanced, which is great. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think um, agents should be excited about this market. It makes us uh, become more a lot more valuable, especially if you have the skill set. If you don't have the skill set, you're in the right place because that's why we're doing these. And you have market centers who are providing lots of classes. So make sure you're taking advantage of them. Just don't become a professional. So you still got to go out there and practice. Right. Yeah, I think time blocking, you know, one thing that um, I've taught my team is I encourage them. If I see some sort of training, whether it's regional, it's at KWI, um, it's an event, or even if it's just something on tax strategies, because, uh, you know, my mission is to basically increase the net worth of as many people as possible. And by doing so, I know they'll give back to their community. And that's important because I grew up here. So whether it's an agent on my team, an agent in my market center, a client, um, some strange person <laughs> that I'm inviting to participate in a, in a charitable organization or a foundation, I think that um, those those wealth building exercises are going to be really important more so than ever. And being able to advise your clients on those are important. And if you're not educated and know more than the person sitting next to you and you haven't time blocked to learn something every single day, you're just going to slide into the category of, again, just being a salesperson instead of a professional real estate consultant, which really takes a continuous uh, degree of education. Uh, I got a question here. I believe they're pointing at you. Um, they're wanting to know if you could share your commission menu. So better way of asking that question is, are you going to change anything in the way your commission structures? Or no, what you so, no. So, I mean, it's basically like a menu and, you know, I'm happy to share it with you. I'm not sure who's asking, but the reality is what we do in our area might be different than your area. And my biggest advice is, um, make a list and I'm sure you have this. I can, I can kind of share my screen if you want and share an example of uh, what we might do for a listing that might give you some ideas, but I do think you, you should be different than everyone else and, and really make it truly custom to your area. Like for instance, we have a real estate TV show. So the only properties that get featured on there are the ones that are kind of in that higher tier. So they know, oh, I'm going to get more, right? They're going to have a longer video made. They're going to be on a TV show. I mean, there's certain things that I might offer that maybe either aren't available or you're just not willing to do or it doesn't make sense in your area. So you kind of have to make it custom to what you do. So I would write down what you would do for any listing. And then I would write down, if you were to get paid 1% more than what you normally charge, then write down everything that you would do in addition to that, that would make sense. Obviously, make sure you get a return on your investment for some of those things, because you'll get two buyers, hopefully for every listing. And then go even think real big, like what are the things that people aren't willing to do to their property? Maybe their house needs painting. Maybe they need landscaping. Maybe their kitchen needs to be gutted. Are you willing to do all that? Um, because I've shared this with some agents and they're like, I, I don't have a clue how to remodel a home. So think about what you personally be willing to do. I'm happy to share my screen. I have it up, um, just as a visual aid that I was going to share anyway. So I'm happy sure. to share that. While you're setting that, what, what you're saying right here reminds me a lot of a section in our opportunities of command where you have the ability to go in and put tasks in place. You also. So yeah. can share these tasks with your clients, letting them know you've completed these tasks on their behalf. So this is a great opportunity to take advantage of that and show your value. So that's really what we're talking about. What is your value? And yeah. we don't, as agents, do a very good job of showing our value. And Command has made that really easy for you to do. Yeah, I love Command. We use Command at a super high level. And I know 
listen, when we started, we probably launched really soon, but think about what other company actually owns their own technology and how far we've come because we had to break it, right? We needed the agents using it. I mean, I flew to Austin years ago before they really even opened it up to teams and they wanted top teams or leadership to really break the system and give feedback. Um, same thing with the luxury communities and all these communities that we've developed. Gary really has wanted the agent's perspective on this. So we actually do have technology that was built by top agents and will continue to be built. So yeah, you could definitely leverage that to share your value. I think um, what's happened in this very easy market we've been in, uh, we've had a lot of agents come into the business as it always happens. It happened in 2004 too. Um, and it's very easy, right? To sell a listing. Uh, there were no contingencies. <laughs> Marketing was, you know, non-existent. You just put it, you know, up for sale. So now we kind of have to go back to, wow, what is our value? We have to reevaluate that. And I've even looked at my marketing and said, okay, I need more marketing people. How can I make this better so that we do share the value? Because we, we have to earn the right to be in business with people. You know, it's funny when I say fortunes in the follow-up, people just expect people to call them back or expect because we have a license, like, well, why wouldn't they want to list with me? Well, they don't know you yet. Like you have to earn the right. So what is personal to you? And I start with my core values. So in all my marketing and my messaging, I'm trying to attract an avatar or someone that is aligned with my belief system and has similar core values. One, they have to be knowledgeable. I'm not really interested in sitting in a, in a room with people that aren't smarter than me, right? I'm not going to learn. So I want to, I want to have people that are around me, whether it's my business organization or clients that are knowledgeable, doesn't have to be in real estate, but can I learn from them? Is this going to be a fun relationship? Cause I like to learn. And then there has to be loyalty. So we always get buyer agreements and listing agreements, of course, and we treat the buyer listings the same as a listing. And then we also have, um, uh, basically loyalty, trust, knowledge. I mean, if they don't have those key core values, we're just going to have a disconnect and there's going to be a problem in our relationship. Okay. So I'll, I'll share. Um, I kind of have them listed as my, my points of difference. This is my listing consultation and I do teach listing classes. So I'm happy to come teach in any of your market centers specific to luxury. But these are just things, and again, these are specific to my team, so don't give overwhelmed. I've been doing this 18 years, or maybe you have something better than this in yours. Um, we basically have our, our real estate lore, right? How many homes we've sold. Uh, again, we update this once a year, so it's actually more than this. We did about 352 units, I believe, last year. That's including commercial and home sites. Uh, 221 of those were home sites that we now partner with builders to build uh, first-time home buyers' dream homes. So we don't just sell luxury. And then we put in there that we have a full-time uh, customer service coordinator, basically the structure. So you can kind of read through this. I don't want to bore you by using a PowerPoint on this call. I really want to just give you as much value, but um, we do include that we have a staging company. So we, for a certain commission, we will give you a free staging consultation. Now, if they want to pay the next tier up, then we might do all the staging on their behalf. And it's usually about $500 a room in case you're wondering what staging might cost. Um, I can take very inexpensive furniture and make a house look better. So it's not as expensive as most people think. And then I also put our property management company in there. So they have that. And then these are some of the marketing strategies. So I'm going to do a lot more if they pay me a higher commission. This is one of those pages that shares what we would do if they choose that tier. So a basic uh, lower commission if they're budget conscious um, I'll, and they say to me on the phone or one of my agents, because I'm not really in heavy production anymore, they might say, well, so-and-so is going to list it for X, Y, Z percent. Great. We're willing to do that too. Let's meet at this, is this time or that time better? And we'll share what we're willing to do for any listing, right? Professional photography, simple stuff like that. And then here's some other things that I think will be beneficial to your property for 1% more. And they always charge, or they always choose like the middle of the road. I never have them choose the 1% off discount of what our, our area kind of is an average. Every area is different. And there, again, there's no set commission. I know we're not supposed to talk about that, but 
Um, you know, we do syndicate to List Hub, Hub Global, which I don't know if um, anyone knows this on this call, but KW Worldwide, you are now able to see those properties on command, which is very cool for luxury. And then, um, you know, we have where we speak with them once a week for feedback reports. Obviously, we set them up on those command neighborhood pages. We send them monthly statistics with our newsletter, uh, social media exposure on all of these platforms. We do a video e-flyer to it's now 8,500 realtors in our area. And then I let them know I'm going to send an e-flyer to the top 1% of agents at Keller Williams Luxury. Now we've taken international off. So again, I, I update this about once a year and that's the top 2,500 agents out of 200,000 agents that specialize in luxury. So that's kind of something that they go, oh, okay, that's interesting. And then of course we use Proxio Pro. We get a huge discount on luxuryrealestate.com with um, being a part of luxury. So in case you don't know about that, and then Mansion Global, Wall Street Journal, Barron's, again, we have a TV show and then basic stuff like listing and transaction coordinator assigned to each file. That's in-house on our team. So we're not leveraging that out. We do have a, a third-party company that we've partnered with as another business for transaction coordination for agents in our market center. And then of course we have um, the real estate magazine with KW Luxury, which is partnered with Unique Homes. And then there's some discounts we get with DuPont. If it's above 3 million, uh, obviously there's certain price points that qualify. And then we do press releases in all the major uh, local newspapers. So, and then I go into kind of some stats with luxury from there.